on today's show, I interview Diane Mays, owner of Dive RVA and founder of Dive Into Diversity. She's also a former athlete who won a Division I NCAA championship and is a four-time All-American as a diver. She shared how being a high achiever is both a help and a hindrance as a business owner, the importance of teams, and how her definition of success today goes far beyond getting on the podium. I'm Julie B, and you're playing the game of leadership. Hey there, I'm Julie B, and this is The Game of Leadership. On this show, I interview athletes who have become entrepreneurs and business leaders about how their experience as an athlete has elevated their leadership. Today, I'm really excited to have Diane Mays on the show, the owner of Dive RVA and founder of Dive Into Diversity. Before starting her companies, Diane won an NCAA national championship in diving and was named a four-time All-American. She's also the first Black woman to coach diving at the D1 level, and I'm so looking forward to this conversation because I know we're going to learn so much about leadership and business ownership and everything in between. So Diane, welcome to the show, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So first question, let's just get this started with uh, some background about your businesses. You you own two, Dive RVA and Dive Into Diversity. Why don't you tell us a little bit about each one of those? The Dive RVA team is a branch of a nonprofit, Dive RVA. Um, I was a former coach here in the Richmond area, and it's kind of ironic that we're you know the capital of Richmond, uh, sorry, capital of Virginia, mm-hmm. and we don't have any public accessible pools that provide all for aquatic or Olympic sports. Uh, we have lots of swimming pools, but all of them, um, well, sorry, majority of them are privatized. And having, you know, had diving around me my whole life, mm-hmm. um, it was kind of a shock to come here and realize that the pool that had diving was pretty, pretty old. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And, you know, a six lane pool when a typical pool is an eight lane pool, but again, it was at a private university, so no one else had access to it. And um, and I just, you know, I I know how much I love my sport. I know how wonderful it was for me, um, just with you know, being my outlet um, from the rest of life. And we don't provide that opportunity for people here in this in the area of Richmond. So we started the nonprofit to help provide and build a full aquatic facility. Um, that will be in our city. Um, we're just in the beginning plans of all of that. But on the other side, we have the dive program. And the dive program is welcome and open to everyone, anyone who wants to try diving. We have established um, several grants that have allowed us to open a dry diving gym, which is um, a place where the kids can come and flip and twist and jump off of diving boards into the big foam pits and um, get spotted in like spotting harnesses and belts. Uh, And we have a tumbling floor, we have mini tramps, we have trampolines, all all the fun equipment to learn the mechanics and basics of diving Hmm. before they even learn water safety, um, because that is a big issue. And we are a city that's on the water. We have a huge river that runs through Richmond and majority of our community doesn't know how to swim or be safe in deep water. So we are working with the city, working with other partners to build um, a, a community that learns water safety at the same time they can learn other sports that then can lead into, you know, a lot of success in other areas just from just from having access. Wow. And tell us a little bit about um, Dive Into Diversity as well. Um, dive Into Diversity came up um, from about a couple of years of conversations. Um, I'm on the DE&I Council for USA Diving. And one of our initiatives is to increase membership um, through all communities. And diving for the past 109 years has typically resembled only one group of people. Mm-hmm. Um, socioeconomically, they are wealthier and they are typically white. Mm-hmm. And for dive into diversity, we are showing the, the world, the nation, um, that there are a lot of other people who are involved in our sport, but we're just in smaller pockets around the nation, around the world. And um, so Dive and Diversity is bringing 
those people, uh, athletes and coaches, Mm -hmm. two different venues. Our first one's going to be in Tempe, Arizona at the end of April. And we are, we have actually the first black woman to ever compete in the Olympics. That was only in 2004. Tora Horton Perrin Chief. She's going to be joining us as one of the coaches. We have several other um, athletes and divers who do represent um, historically marginalized communities in the sport of diving who are going to come and provide their expertise and um, and talents to uh, kids in the area um, that come from well, one group we're working with. And I'm so excited is um, a group that fosters LGBTQ plus stu- uh, children mm-hmm. who don't have housing. Uh, another group is uh, another set of students who are in lower income. And what I love about the Tempe area is that we're not just hitting, uh, to me in Richmond, our you know large population is a black population. Mm-hmm. But with Tempe, we have um, people who are coming from the different Indian reservations, or we have a Hispanic population there, along with um, you know, the LGBTQ and a, a lower income white population. So I love we're really getting the blend of of kids to introduce them to like I said, this most amazing sport ever. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to take the next showcase on out to California, to Riverside, California. Mm-hmm. And um, we're planning other venues for the fall and into the next year. Wow. So Diane, you know, you, you were doing so many amazing things and um, I, I did not play any sports at the level or compete at the level that you did, but I did, I did play sports through high school. And so many of the things that you mentioned, um, and what you just talked about the the lessons I learned from from playing sports have translated into so many parts of my life. I think it's really fantastic that you're trying to help um, usually under underserved and marginalized populations that don't typically access or have access to these things um, get access to them. So that is that is an amazing uh, an amazing pursuit. Um, I do want to ask you though, what, what do you find to be your favorite part about being a founder and a business owner? What's your favorite, what's the favorite part of that work for you? That it's really easy to talk to your boss when there's problems. Um, (laughs) um, but honestly, I think the, what makes it awesome is that it's really a business the way I want to see business. Um, I'm not following other people's rules. I'm not on other people's schedules for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just really allows me to share my vision in yeah. my way. That's, that's really, that's, I, that's usual. That's a, that's a pretty common and, and, but the way that you said it is sharing your vision in your way, that, that is an uncommon way that I've heard that, that answered um, to, about being your own boss. And it is, it is easy to have conversations with the boss, but sometimes you, you could talk to yourself a little too much too. <laughs> so true. So true. <laughs> so I, I'm going to make an assumption about, about you that you are a high achiever, just given kind of your, your background and, and all of the things you're doing now. And one thing, and if, if, if it's the wrong assumption, you can correct me, but I, I'm curious as to how how being a high achiever, or having that drive to succeed has has really helped you in business thus far. Um, I will appreciate the compliment. Thank you. Um, not sure if that is really how I am, but um, I, I almost would say uh, it might be more of a hindrance than a help. Mm. Um I, I definitely believe that you need to try everything. Um, and, and I was always, I was one of four children. And I remember one of my siblings asking me, how come you always get X, Y, and Z? Mm-hmm. And it's like, Cause I ask, you know, like, and I also know that sometimes I don't get other things, but mm-hmm. I ask for everything. And that's what I found in business too, mm-hmm. is I, I'm continuing to ask. I'm asking for help with any area that I don't understand. I'm asking for people to help connect me to others who I think can help the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that might be part of the drive that mm-hmm. I have is that I know this can be done mm-hmm. and I might not have, might not have all the resources right now, mm-hmm. but I know there are people out there who, who do have those resources and, and can help me find them. So my drive is to continually ask um, to get where I want to be. Yeah. 
So how, how, help me unpack that a little bit. How, how do you see, how do you see that drive being a hindrance? Cause I don't hear a hindrance there. How, how, what do you mean by that? Well, um, you know, there are times that you can, I don't know. I, I feel like sometimes I could maybe be pushing one thing, you know, and until it's literally like, it's not possible, but I'm still trying to push it. So um, my drive might might lead me to a, a dead end and it takes me a minute to see that. Then, okay, this is not the right way to go. Let's try to find another path. Um, but it, at the same time, though, it doesn't allow me to to stop there, to quit. Because um, it is easy. It, it is easy when, it's very easy when you hear no's. It's very easy when you don't see the clear path of how to go with the business mm-hmm. to be like, you know what, this, this is, just isn't working. Let's just be done. And mm-hmm. I guess I don't believe in that because I know there's a way <laughs> <laughs> we are. We can be a stubborn bunch business yes. owners. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> hey, this is Julie V. And thanks for watching the game of leadership. I'm here today with Diane Mays. And we're having a great conversation about just the ins and outs of being a business owner and, and all of those um, just parts that we all struggle with, I think. And, and Diane, one thing I wanted to ask you is, have you, have you ever experienced burnout um, either as an athlete or a business owner? And, and if you have, would you share a story about that? Gosh, well, with my business, I have to say no, because it's so new. Um, and, and I'm enjoying every moment of it and all the excitement and every turn that comes with it. Mm Um, as an athlete, Probably, but it always seemed like the minute I was questioning um, if this is really what I want to keep doing, if this is where I want to be, another door would open um, and it would give me that, you know, that second wind. Um, And as I said previously, like diving was my my safe place. It was my Mm -hmm. escape from reality. And so that really was never something that I wanted to let go of. I think mm-hmm. exact opposite. Maybe when I should have been done, I wasn't. I didn't mm-hmm. let myself burn out um, with with being an athlete yeah. um, before, you know. And I probably maybe maybe should have, but um, yeah. No, I. I mean, I've had burnout in other things yeah. uh, before. I was before I started this business. I was a teacher, oh, and well. we hear a lot about teacher burnout. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I was a middle school math teacher for twelve years, and I can definitely say that that ran its course. Mm-hmm. So I have experienced it, mm-hmm. um, and you know, and I did stop teaching right after COVID. I think that was yeah. the straw that that really made me realize this is not for me anymore. It has changed too much that it's not my passion and I mm-hmm. love kids and I found a different way to yeah. help still educate and, and teach them um, without having to be in the classroom. And you'll probably find that as you go in business, you'll have those moments as well. Um, I Most business owners I know that have been in business for, I would say two plus years have some type of burnout story. Um, and what you know it's like practice the the more often you do it the better you get at it and i think you know the experiences that you've had with it and um and your athletic career as well as a teacher will 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 help you uh, navigate that a little bit better uh, if if it happens uh, for you as a as a business owner i'm sure so, it will. <laughs> yeah so diane one one question i want to ask you is uh, have you have you experienced parallels between being an athlete and being a business owner? And if you have, like, what, what are those parallels that you've seen for yourself? I mean, plain and simple, you put the work in, you get the, the success out. Um, you know, in athletics, you have usually have a goal beginning of the season of what you're training for um, with business. You have a goal of what you want to achieve either financially, like fiscally that, that, month, year or whatever, um, or just with memberships in your business, whatever your goals are for your business, uh, you know, you set those, but they're not going to happen unless you put the work in. Mm -hmm. Um, And I mean, I know that's pretty, pretty Mm -hmm. obvious um, and straightforward, but, but then there does come um, with being a business owner, you Mm -hmm. know, keeping the morale and keeping the team, my, my coaches, my other employees invested and continuing to go with, the program is the same as when you're on a team, you know, you have one teammate who's not feeling it or not, not there with you. It's going to change the whole dynamic of the program. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's that continual support. I mean, I really think 
team sports and um, being an athlete are just there is so there are so many parallels mm-hmm. to the real real work force and I think I would guarantee that I would almost guarantee that some of the students that go through the programs that you have out there now are are the future business leaders, the future entrepreneurs are because you just learn so much um, being an athlete. And I think especially when you when you're a competitive athlete, because you learn how to win and you learn how to lose, you mm-hmm. know, you learn how to to not meet goals and keep going. And that's something also that perseverance, that relentlessness is something that you almost have to have to succeed as a business owner. And I think that the sports, especially at as, as young of an age as possible, can really um, instill that mentality in, in, in kids and, and set them up for success no matter what they do in life. Yes. And I also think that being an athlete teaches you how to accept other people's opinions, how to, I mean, cause you, you have different coaches throughout your career and, um, and you I definitely have, you know, like I said, different teammates and different people will be, will tell you what they think about how you should do something or, mm-hmm. um, and it's, it's wonderful skill to have because if you have only been in things where you do it your way and you get your result because of how you did it your way mm-hmm. without any other feedback or without anyone else coaching you, that's going to be hindrance in the mm-hmm. in the workforce and in the business world. You need to be able to listen and have the skill to, and, and granted, there's times that you might hear directions or instruction from someone, but and you process it and realize, well, let me try that, or maybe put that on the back burner and I'll maybe try it later, or just realize that really isn't for me, but at least you have the ability to listen and process that mm-hmm. or others will just tune out or just ignore and not, or not even seek the help of someone else. And that's, that's a critical skill in business ownership because you, if you, you can, it's really easy when you start your own business to, to kind of find yourself in a silo of, especially if you're a solopreneur or you're, or you're the only, you know, if you don't have team members who are willing to kind of push back on you, who are working with you or for you, um, it's really easy to get pretty stubborn that this this is absolutely the right path to go. Yeah. Um, and there's a balance between like knowing what you want to do and hearing feedback and and accepting that feedback to make something better, but still go in the direction. And then also just, you know, some people just completely ignore feedback. And I think athletes have gotten have gotten used to being coached or mm-hmm. getting, you know, even getting corrected in terms of your form or all of those little little technical things from uh, I mean and you have probably a million of those little technical things that you teach uh, or have have learned over the years in diving where you know one little turn of your foot can make all the difference in the world and practicing that over and over again and you have to be willing to get the feedback about yeah like just 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 move your foot inward or out or just a little bit and it'll make everything great some people even the little feedback, even those little feedback points like that really have a hard time hearing that. And I think uh, being an athlete sets you up to uh, be able to better hear and then digest it and then do something with it instead of getting defensive or reactive to it. Especially if you've been doing it one way for the longest time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I have that with, with my athletes. I'm like, all right, I want you to try this. It feels weird. It feels different. I'm like, well, sometimes different is good. And I have to keep reminding them that, that yes, it is going to feel different because it is different than what you're doing, but let's look at the end result. Look what it's changing. Look how it's helping you progress and then getting them to want to stick with that technique or that instruction um, is, is challenging. And that's the same, especially, I mean, gosh, with, with business, if this is how we've always done it, it's scary to try something new. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and also you don't often see the instant results from change. And, um, but again, just like in sports, you have to be open to it. You're watching the game of leadership and I'm the host, Julie B. I'm here with Diane Mays and we're just having a fantastic conversation about the parallels between being an athlete and being a business owner. And we've, we've talked about, um, your team a lot and I'm just, I'm curious as to what what are you the most proud of at this moment uh, for your team in terms of your businesses? What what are you the most proud of right now that that they have accomplished or that you all have all accomplished together? 
Um, one that when I have to leave town to go do a conference or some other meeting that the house does not burn down, um, you know, that the program's still functioning, the parents and kids are still happy. Um, and my coaches are, are still happy, um, coming to work the next day. But really what I am so proud of is that they, like, they're not fake. They come with the real energy. They come with the real support of the program. They believe in it, which Mm -hmm. I think that is what sells the business Mm -hmm. is that the people who, I mean, yes, I'm one person, but I'm not the whole business. And the people who are on the front lines, the kid, the people, my coaches who are um, working with the kids right from the very beginning, because I don't coach the beginner level athletes. I will coach the top tier Mm -hmm. of our program and they make it so much fun. They make these kids want to come back and sign up and, and it's funny, like we don't realize it until because one of our programs we only do in the fall and the spring. And this year we had to make a winter session of it, mm-hmm. magically fit one in because these kids had so much fun. And my, my staff, like the, uh, they did an amazing job of, of making it, you know, an awesome experience. And even though we had to do less pool time, they still wanted to come. Like that's how awesome it was. So um, that's what I'm most proud of is that they, they are loving what they're doing and they are sharing that with everyone else. That is something to be very proud of, uh, especially as early on as you are in in all of this. Uh, So Diane, I'm really curious, how do you define success for now? And and how has that changed since your days as an athlete? How, How have you seen how you define success change? Um, well, I definitely think, you know, as an athlete, success was, was I on the podium? Um, and then as a coach, you know, I would, when I coached the Atlantic 10, I was awarded uh, coach of the year five times. And, and that was an example of my success, along with getting athletes to um, the zone qualifier or the national championship or you know, winning the conference. Mm-hmm. So it was all about your place, your finish, your titles. Yeah. Um, for me with my business, my six, I, I feel that we are successful when we have reached the community that we've set out to, when they become involved, when they are part of our program, our success is not measured by awards in any which mm-hmm. way it is truly about our, for us, it's our community outreach. And, and there's a really unique shift there that I think happens. You go from, that's the shift from defining success by goal achievement alone um to being more about you know milestones but there's 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 a you can arrive at success and stay there when you when you're defining success the way that you're defining it now instead of okay well I was on the podium this year but you know right as soon as you step off the podium I bet you started thinking okay I got to get back on the podium again you know there's always that next thing if if you only define success by goals so yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really, really great uh, shift in in that definition. Probably feels probably feels a little bit better too, if I had to guess. <laughs> and it does because it's it's to me it's more solid because it's mm-hmm. a constant. Oh well, hopefully it's a constant. Hopefully the yeah. um, the people are still with with you, but it definitely it it allows for uh, like, honestly a, a longer reflection of what just happened because again, like getting on the podium just reflects that last event mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, and yes the the weeks of training beforehand or months mm-hmm. of training but it really is that moment in time mm-hmm. and with having our community involved and having them be part of our program and the continual outreach and them reaching out to their friends and inviting them to come join them um at our at our gym mm-hmm. is that to me that i mean you, I don't know, you can't does it get better than that no it doesn't it truly doesn't that is fantastic. Well, Diane, I have enjoyed this converse, conversation so much today. I'm so excited to get it out and, and to our uh, our listeners and our audience. But I do have one one last question for you today. But what um, what leadership skill or trait did you learn as an athlete? Do you think has helped you the most in business? I think a big part of my experience as an athlete is different than most for, for diving. Um, I was not your typical diver. 
I was black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I was the only black diver I saw the whole time I dove. Mm -hmm. I did see a couple coaches, mm -hmm. um, but outside of that, I was the only female. Mm -hmm. And um, what's kind of interesting is now being a black female business owner, mm -hmm. um, It that has helped me to, to understand the, the world that I have to work with. Um, and it's a world that doesn't understand me as, as well as I think it, it well, it could, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, but, but being kind of always in the background, um, and then just popping up every once in a while, you know, with great yeah. meats, <laughs> um, and it, it's kind of the same with my business, you know, I'm, I'm, we're, we're in the background, um, but we are mm -hmm. stand, we we're, we, we do stand out. Um, and I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but <laughs> there's, well, there's a, there's a skill there that is it's somewhere around the, the lines of, I, I don't want to say take advantage of, but it's, it's almost like how to optimize being in the background to your, to your advantage or how to, how to map capitalize on that. You know, I might say it's like reading the room, you know? Like, yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Definitely have learned when and where. For the most part, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, that's, yeah. Timing, you know, timing is, timing is very important in business. Um, I actually just taught a class last night there to a bunch of uh, people who are just getting their businesses started. And we were talking about the, their business concept statement and it's basically the how, who, when, what, where, why, and how. And I, I said, out of all of these, the when is the hardest one to control. And we talked about things like seasonality and, you know, you can decide when you're going to start a business, but you've got to, that's pretty much, you know, when you launch things are pretty much, that's pretty much the only when you get to control. There's a lot of things that you don't know when you go into business, but yeah, there's something to knowing when and where to make your presence known. I think there's an art to that. And I, I don't know what that word is for it, but I get what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, Diane, I have so enjoyed this conversation. I just want to thank you for being on the show again. It's it's just been a, it's been a great uh, learning experience for me as well. So thanks for being here today. Thank you. This has been so much fun. And that is it for this episode, but stay tuned because I'll be back soon with more conversations and leadership lessons from athletes turned entrepreneurs. I'm Julie B and thank you for playing the game of leadership.